So welcome, welcome everybody. Okay, I've got about 20 minutes to run through why I'm on stage and how I can help you. Uh, bear in mind that a lot of what I've said, I will say is um, um, pretty pragmatic, I was told yesterday. I was talking in Brussels in front of a whole load of Flemish uh, angels. So it's quite, quite direct and um, shows this experience I've had. So to start with the, just a little bit about me, uh, I've got about 20 slides in total, so I'll try and do about one a minute. This is me with a, a chap called Baybars, who Candice will know, who was handing me this piece of glass, which is the best piece of glass I've had, sorry Jenny, uh, <laughs> for your award, uh, which says best angel investor of the world. Um, I suspect there was a short list of one, but I happened to be there at the time, and it doesn't have a date on it either, so when I go back to Istanbul next year, <laughs> you can't take it away. Um, so wh why am I here? This is my first business, which is a travelling disco, which I set up in, uh, at university back in 1975 and sold it again after a year. Uh, it works out, if you work out how much time I spent on it, I was earning less than the minimum wage at that point, or the equivalent of the minimum wage. But my first proper business was up here, which was in Germany in 81. And since then, I've set up an, about 10 businesses over the years, mostly B2B. I've actually made more money out of property development. The house, these houses here I built and built some more. And this is a, um, a, a 12th century cottage that was actually lost quite a lot of money on there. I've got some, still got some tax losses to <laughs> carry forward on that. Um, and, and various other businesses. Then I, um, in fact, the one at the bottom left here, I, it was, I was, I, it's where I learnt to be what the term angel was. This was about 10 or 11 years ago, and we sold it quite quickly. So although that's not an angel investment as such, it was an exit where I got to understand what angels do. And it wasn't that long ago. I'm, I'm actually challenged sometimes, you know, why haven't you been doing it? If you talk to the Blakely, brother, Blakely, Blakely brothers, who you may or may not know, they've been doing it 17 years. But I have learned a lot. But I've done a lot of other things as well. So these are a load of roles that I've had and have over the years. The ones on the left are charities. You might recognise Russell Brand. He got clean at um, Focus 12 uh, before I was chair there. And so I, most of these charities are actually social enterprises. So I've actually done a lot of work on reducing the dependency on charitable bodies on grant income and turning them into social enterprise. So I do, I, although I don't invest much in social enterprise, I do know, know quite a lot about that. On the right hand side, top there is UK Business Angels, Jenny, and I'm on the board there. One below the Angel Co Fund, we talked, uh, Jenny talked about earlier, where I'm on the investment committee. One below that's Federation of Small Businesses, some of you will know, and policy chair there. So that gets me closer to government because of that. The bottom one there is quite important because I actually helped set up a corporate angel, a corporate VC, using money off the balance sheet of a family company in Cambridge called Marshall, which some of you might know because of the aviation connection here in Bournemouth. And on the right, um, the fellow of, uh, of the Judge Business School and, of course, the Cambridge Angels, which is where I learnt most of what I'm going to talk about. So I joined about eight or nine years ago. And in fact, looking back on it, after five years of, as membership, se membership secretary, now a year as chair, I wouldn't have let myself in. But they did let me in, <laughs> and I'm here now, <laughs> for reasons I might explain. <laughs> and I've done a lot of angel investments. Now, I've really embraced this in a big way. Um, I'm also very open about it, as you'll see on the next slide, in that uh, the full portfolio are all on the website, my criteria on my website, all my successes are on the website, not with any monetary values, but um, and all my failures and why I believe they failed. You won't know any of these names, I should think, apart from Syndicate Room. Syndicate Room doesn't actually fit in with my criteria because um, I mainly do deepish tech B2B. But Gonzalo, who set it up, became, well, I mentored him when he was still doing his um, masters at the judge, and I, I, I was in the first two family and friends rounds. Then I was in the down round, <laughs> talk about that later. And then I've been in the up round since then. So, but most of these are deep tech businesses. So I don't expect you to read these, don't worry, because I'm just about to move on from this slide to a set of pictures illustrating the main points of my investment criteria. Now bear in mind these, and I'll move on now, but those are all on my website. These have been built up over the 10, so eight or 10 years of, of um, uh, investment and experience. And they all come from experience, not just my experience, but other angels I've met and known, I've got to become friends with and go skiing with and sailing, etc. So these are the core ones. In fact, there's one other which I only added to the slide yesterday when I was in Brussels, um, which is to do with the distance from home. So I'll just mention that one first. So I, I don't invest more than an hour's public transport from home. I have the guy who set up the Cambridge Angels um, who'd had a massive exit, four and a half billion dollar exit in the late 90s in the States, he claims to only invest in business he can cycle to. 
but he does have investments in California. So, <laughs> Anyway, just run through this very briefly. At top left, um, this is team size. So three is great, two's even better, one is too few in my view. So one, the problem is very lonely being an entrepreneur and there's nobody to bounce stuff off. It's, um, and of course you've got a single point of failure as far as the investors are concerned. Four is generally too many. I'm sure there's plenty of exceptions to that, but four in my experience becomes three after two, three years. And also if it's four or five or six, you've got a very much bigger pie. They all want life-changing amounts of money at the end of it, and therefore you end up with a higher valuation. Bottom left, and that's not copied from Jenny's slide. I think I used it before she did, and it actually is a little more, more danger in my slide. This is the support that angels can give. So I expect to be able to give support. Before we do the middle of the section, the top right, you don't need to be investing in something that's in a billion dollar market, in my view. At a hundred million market, you can still get a really good exit as an angel. You know, you know something that's turning over low millions, you can easily get your 10 or 20x, providing there's some strong IP in there. Next one down is defensibility. Some of you remember the Monty Python and the Black Knight and had all these limbs chopped off and then he went, come back over here, I'm going to bite your leg off. So defensibility, I'm expecting a level of defensibility. Not a pattern, I've got lots I could talk about patterns, but which I'm not convinced are worth having except on exit. Bottom right, syndication, learning, getting together. In Belgium, I heard yesterday that 20% of angels will never ever invest in the business if there's another angel in there. What a weird thing compared with what we are in the UK. Very strange. So very briefly, on the middle then, the bottom two basically say the same thing, deep tech and B2B. I really don't understand B2C. I've had three B2C businesses and I've never really understood how to scale them. The top one in the middle is on two of my rules. Um, this is lifetime value and customer acquisition cost. For anybody in, the, in fact, most of you in the room will understand that. So if your customer acquisition cost is more than the value of that customer, you haven't got a profitable business, have you? So a figure of 2.934 or whatever is very important. So three slides which I show to both angels and entrepreneurs now. Entrepreneurs must listen. This is, and I'm sure you've experienced this, the people who are in the room have done angel investing. If they don't listen, they don't have to listen to me and believe me. And I often say, you know, take somebody else's view as well. But they must listen to the market. They must listen to their staff. They must listen to their suppliers, their customers, and everything else. So they must, it takes time to work out whether they do listen. Even though they listen, they must still be driven, passionate, focused, etc. So you mustn't be able to move them from the tar, the sort of initial direction. But you know, many, we talk about pivots a lot. They will need to listen out there to make a pivot at the right time. And they must also not lie. And this is really important. I'm, um, I, oh, there's all kinds of anecdotes I can tell you about this, but I'll tell you one that I usually tell, which is this um, uh, entrepreneur in Cambridge, actually, who um, claimed to have had a good exit. And when you dig into it, it didn't look very good on the company's house when I looked at it. And when I'd met his co-founder to find that it was an insolvent exit, that is no way that's classed as a good exit. So I, I probably do a little bit more DD than most people into the background, but there's so much available online. If you don't lie, and this means to both of us, this is the entrepreneur and us, the people in the audience, then you build up trust. You have an open, better relationship. That, the journey is better for both parties, for all parties. So, and, and this is part of the project, the educational project I'm going to talk about right at the end of this. And then this is also very important. Not the slide itself, and I don't know where it came from, but, uh, and I doubt it exists, but this is doing due diligence on each other. We do a lot of due diligence on the entrepreneurs, don't we? We, we check them out, we check their background, we get to know them, etc. They've got to do it on us. As I was saying in, yesterday in Brussels, much to the slight amazement of the audience, if I deal lead, I will chuck investors out. I will actually go through what they've got pledged and remove those. This is for where I think there's going to be some detrimental effect to those investors. Now, it's only with a lot of experience you can do that. It's, I mean, particularly if it's family and friends money you're checking out. But it's just to explain that, you know, to entrepreneurs, they must check us out as well. A few slides now on um, just my experience, because when you've done 60-odd investments, over 120 rounds, there is data which can be mined. So this is um, contact to close. So you can see the one on the bottom left was rather too short, possibly, and that, <laughs> that soon failed. But on average, it's for 5.2 months. So this is the point where you, the pitch occurs, the inbox gets the business plan in it, and the exit. So, um, oh, sorry, the, the, the close, not the exit. That's the next slide. So 5.2 months sounds a bit long. Entrepreneurs don't like it to say it like long, but you know it has been much longer than that. 
and years to exit. Not much data yet, um, and again, you'll see all my exits on the uh, on my website. But the 17x doesn't shouldn't really count. That was the one that initial investment I made, which I was sort of co-founding really anyway. The 5x. Uh, narrowly picked the post for being the best exit of the year at the UK BAA Awards <laughs> earlier this year. That was an IP sale. And in fact, interestingly, that, just to give, put that in context, the strong IP, it was a strategic purchase. If, if you took sales into account, it was actually 200 times annual sales. So it had nothing to do with the sales there. It's to do with the potential growth. But 1.4, and the exits here, because I haven't been doing that long, are relatively short, four or five years. And this slide's probably about six months out of, no, a bit more than that, 12 months out of date, and I haven't had any exits recently. So all those blue bars should go up a bit, or some of them go up a bit. Right, this is again a really, really, really important slide for both entrepreneurs and angels. If you take, this is CB Insights data, and if you take the top two, which I don't think you can probably read, what the top one says no market need, and the next one's ran out of cash. That's basically the same thing, which I've summarized in black there. So 70% of deals fail because they haven't found product market fit, i.e. contribution, not just, well, gross contribution is probably enough, but net contribution if possible, because that means at least the business is sustainable before there's either an exit or reliable profits and the investors have run out of patience. So in almost all cases, you know, it's because we stop investing and they can't find anybody else to invest. They haven't got to the point where they're self-sustaining. And it's to do with product market fit. Just a quick look at my funnel. So I get about 1,200 deals a year coming in. I do have somebody helping me. So this, the, this corporate venturing camp, Martlet, has somebody who I've, trained up from, he was a friend of, my wife's in the audience somewhere, I can't see her at the moment, but one of, a, f a friend of one of her children, it was a second relationship, and um, uh, I've trained him up and he knows so much about this, so he's actually helps with this process, and I close six to ten a year. Some stats here, again, they're on my website. Um, I'm going to tell you a few war stories in a minute, but um, founding team size, slightly less than two, so clearly I do invest in one man, one man and woman bands, Unfortunately, not many women bands, but we'll come to that in a moment. Good, good degrees. Now, that doesn't, having a good degree doesn't mean you're going to be a good entrepreneur by any means at all. You don't need academic background. But you, as an entrepreneur, your ability to learn and listen is really important. And there is a correlation between that and, and, the sort of, and, and going to university in general. But it's just because I self-select. I, I select entrepreneurs who I relate to, and I went to, uh, I went, had a good degree. Very few have MBAs, as it turns out. Now, I don't know what that proportion is in the country with degrees. I suspect it's probably less than that, but having an MBA is not that important, even though I'm a fellow of a management school. Average age, more than I would have expected. I would have expected 31, 32, but it actually works out later than that. So there is hope for uh, older entrepreneurs. Only 7% female. Now, this is because I invest primarily in STEM, or possibly STEAM, as we're about to hear in a minute. <laughs> we, the, like the lady to explain what STEAM is. But STEM, and there, and there aren't, the British education system's been particularly poor at producing female STEMs. Now, there's all kinds of reasons for that. I won't go into now. And close friend Simon Thorpe, who was Angel of the Year last year, is working hard on that, has got his views. Um, but it's be because I do engineering and mathematics and technology, and I, there aren't a lot of women doing that. There are plenty of women, well not plenty, there are quite a lot of women in life sciences, but I don't do much life sciences. So if I did some more life sciences, I would probably find more female. But hopefully that will change. Repeat entrepreneurs, nearly half have already tried. And most, not most, but more than half have not been successful. I don't have a problem with that. Actually, I like that. I like the fact they've made a load of mistakes. I like, as long as they're open about those mistakes. And the rest of them you can read there, just, just some other statistics. These slides, most of these slides will be available later. But. So let's just run through a few lessons. So very important, the top one, back a team. In fact, I was doing a study recently where, um, for, for a European study on, it's actually clean tech on, on and, and I was presented with a couple of business plans. And one of the business plans I gave back to the researcher without knowing what they were doing, because I looked, went straight to the team, wandered through the team, related what, what I liked and didn't like about them, and decided the team was non-backable. I didn't even look, I didn't even know what it was. I knew it was clean tech, but I don't know what it was. So it's back a team, this is so important. This old adage, you know, a poor idea and a great team is a better bet than a great idea and a poor team. The pint of beer test, this is only really applies if you're going to be close to the board, a board director, observer, or close to the entrepreneur. 
have some chemistry there. Enjoy their company. Make sure they enjoy your company. You'll get a lot more out of that relationship. The, the, board, the difficult board meetings where you're running out of cash or you're having to fire a senior person or even fire a founder sometimes have done much better if there's chemistry there. Don't back founders in personal relationship. Learned this the hard way. <laughs> personal relationship actually here really means emotional relationship. Um, so this is hus well, it's boyfriend, girlfriend, husband, wife. And the reason for that is, and I'm sure there are examples, maybe even this room of successful businesses, is if you've got two, there's an emotional relationship. You haven't actually got two founders, you've got one founder. Those two are never going to disagree with each other. And if they do disagree with each other, you've got an even bigger problem. <laughs> you've, got, you've got to somehow, um, yeah, you've got two founders who are separating from each other. Pre-investment build-up, trust, we talked about that. Difficult conversations. In fact, the valuation is less difficult conversation we experience and all the deal leading I've done than the good lever, bad lever. This is to do with at what point does the founder lose their right, the voting rights or lose their shares, which of course we've done with reverse vesting, etc. There's some really difficult. And because part of the problem is that we as angels or experienced deal leads know what we're talking about, and they don't. So that communication needs, so you need to educate them and negotiate at the same time, which isn't very easy, I can tell you. Co-investing angels with VCs with care. I have a list on my phone, which I think other, some other angels do, on, of people I would not co-invest with and not back. These are people I've had experience with or other people. Open trusting relationship, and as I was just saying to somebody just before over coffee, it's easy to get divorced and sell illiquid angel shares. Remember that. There are a lot of things going on with giving liquidity to us. You know, this 8 to 12 years or 8 to 10 years in Jenny's case, the numbers that are floating around. Having to liquidity would be great, wouldn't it? It would give us the ability to reinvest or change our risk profile. Just a quick slide on the Cambridge Angels. Um, unfortunately, bottom left, we only have three women out of 65. For the reasons I said, really, on the top right, they're mostly exited tech entrepreneurs and we just can't find them. Age distribution, unfortunately, is mostly white, middle-aged men. Um, location, mainly Cambridge. But this sort of the activities on the bottom right there. So the individual angels, we have three VC members who are Cambridge VCs, Cambridge Innovation Capital, Amadeus and IQ. They co they're allowed to co-invest with us on the same terms. Together, we've put 21 million in uh, last year, the two groups together. So two more slides. Why am I doing this? I, why, I sort of I stumbled into angel investing eight or nine years ago. I absolutely adore it. I, you can tell the sort of passion, in, hopefully, in my voice. So uh, helping pol policymakers. The bottom line: break even over a ten-year time frame. I'm pretty confident I'll do better than that, but there's no guarantees. And then th this slide here. So I've decided, which is non-competitive with Jenny, and Jenny knows all about it, to share all my experience as an entrepreneur, all my experience as an angel and put it into something that, in fact, my younger son, who's turning 30 in a couple of weeks' time, is working full-time for me on, which is to turn it into some education for people in the audience and for entrepreneurs, both to uplift, upskill the angels, teach the entrepreneurs how to cope with us and work with us, and together just to improve the ecosystem. And the underlying will be openness, transparency. And it's difficult to do, it's difficult for an, angel, an entrepreneur to be totally open when they're selling to you, but if you can build that relationship, it'll work well. And finally, just the final slide here is just me in some unusual positions. The one on the right is probably the most interesting. I am illegally driving a double-decker bus, <laughs> which is one of my investments. <laughs> That's me on Killy, and this is me in Bali with one of my children. So I will leave it at that. I'm part of the panel later on, so if you've got any questions, you can take them then. Thank you. <laughs>